So, uh, what's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Ming Xunzhou. I'm a PhD student from Carnegie Mellon University. Today, I'm very happy to share with you our paper, Locally Differentially Private Sparse Vector Aggregation. Here are my co authors, Tian Hao Wang, Hubert Chen, Julia, and Elaine. So, what is private vector aggregation? Well, imagine that you have n clients, um, each client could have some local private data. And then they represent their data using d dimensional vector and we assume those values are in negative one and one. And now the server is trying to aggregate those vectors and figure out what is the summation of those vectors. To pr protect their own privacy, the client will use some privacy preserving encodings to encode their um, local vector and upload the encodings to the server. Then the server will run some estimation algorithm on those encodings and output the estimation of the sum vector. So this is um, pretty straightforward. And why would we do something like this? It turns out that um, private vector aggregation can be very useful in private data analytics. It can be used for, uh, for example, item frequency estimation, can be used for hypothesis testing, and even for clustering. And it also has a lot of real world applications, for example, browser data collection, advertisement system, and federated learning. There are a lot of companies that are trying to do similar things, for example, Google, uh, Mozilla, Meta, and Apple. In our paper, we focus on sparse vectors. So uh, let's say we have a movie rating aggregation task, such that we are aggregating uh, the user's rating to those movie. <clears throat> and let's say we have 10 to the five clients and 20,000 movies, and each user will only rate about 10 movies, something like that. And if we compile each user's rating to all those movies, the vector could be very, very sparse. Another great example is the sparsification technique for federated learning. In federated learning, the user will update their local gradient to the central server for some machine learning training. But here, when they update their gradient vector to the server, they will apply a random masking to zero out some of the coordinates in the vector. And their gradient now is very, very sparse. And previous papers have shown that with this technique, the client could save a lot of communication cost while the central server can still train a pretty good machine learning model. So in our paper, we focus on k-sparse vector. It means there are at most k non-zero coordinates in the same vector. And um, we assume different clients could have different sparsity pattern. There is actually a tension between communication versus the estimation error for private vector aggregation problem, especially the sparse case. Uh, the canonical way to handle uh, vector in privacy literature is the Gaussian mechanism, but the Gaussian mechanism will add um, Gaussian noise to each coordinate in the, same uh, in the same vector, making the output not sparse anymore, so we actually lose the advantage of the communication. There is also some uh, central sparse vector releasing technique, but they are more suitable in the central setting instead of the aggregation setting. There are also methods for dense vectors, but those methods are not utilizing um, sparsity very well, making them have non-optimal error. So our target is to have a low communication and low estimation algorithm. To formally define the privacy, we use a pretty standard um, local differential privacy definition. It says for any neighboring vectors, x and x prime, their privacy preserving encodings should be very similar. For those who are not familiar with DP, just think about those distribution are very, very close. Actually, with different neighboring definition, we could have different level of privacy. For example, a weaker definition is called the event level privacy. It says for any two vectors such that only differ in one entry, then we require their um, encodings to be very similar. Uh, it is called event level because uh, we can sometimes think about each coordinate in the same vector can be thinking about some individual event. In this case, when the adversary observes the encodings, it cannot distinguish for that particular location whether it is A or whether it is B. A stronger level of privacy is called a user level privacy. It says for any two k sparse vectors, their encodings should be very similar. In this case, basically, the adversary cannot sure about anything from the original input. In our paper, we actually use a more unified privacy definition 
It is called the LLDP. It says for any two vectors, x and x prime, if their L1 distance is bounded, then their encodings should be very similar. And actually, this unified privacy definition is pretty general. For example, L equals to two implies uh, event level privacy, and L equals to two K implies user level privacy. And in the middle ground, we have more flexible uh, privacy definition. Now let's talk about some algorithm design. Um, in this talk, I would try to make it as simple as possible. So we're gonna assume those inputs are all zero one vectors. Uh, I'm gonna start from one sparse encoding and I'm gonna talk about how we construct a straw man scheme and how we use our basic scheme to overcome the drawbacks of those straw, uh, straw man scheme. I'm not gonna cover our full scheme here and I'm not gonna cover detailed theoretical analysis. So let's start from a very, very basic um, thing that is a one sparse and even non-private encoding. Now the encoder is given an input x and it's a one sparse uh, zero on the vector. So let's say in location i, there is a one out there. So the encoder will sample a binary hash s and the binary hash will output, zero, uh, will output plus one or negative one for each coordinate. And the, enco the encoding scheme is pretty simple that would simply include the hash values for that particular location i and also the whole description about the binary hash. It turns out that we can actually use a uh, random seed to represent the binary hash. So the encoder is very efficient. For the decoder, it simply take this encoding and it simply take the hash bit and multiply that bit to the whole hash um, vector. And we call this output as our decoded vector. So what really happens here is that the decoder will have a very nice output distribution. To the location i, because we take the hash value from location i and multiply it again to the whole vector. So to the location i, it is guaranteed to be si multiplied by si. And because our binary hash only output negative one or one, so the multiplication will definitely be one. For any other location j, um, the uh, output will be si multiplied by sj. And if we assume the binary hash is uniformly random, then this value is a random bit. It is plus one or negative one with probability a half. So it's pretty nice. So the server aggregation is very simple. That is simply sum of all the decoded vectors. And here's a very, very simple analysis. For example, let's say only client one has a value one in location i, and cl client two to client n will all have zero in that location. After the encoding and decoding process, client one is guaranteed to output a one in that location, and client two to client n will output a random bit. And the summation of all those values is exactly one plus a random walk of plus one or negative one with step n minus one. And this analysis actually applies to every other location. So um, for any location i, the output would be the true count plus a plus one ne negative one random walk with the count of n minus the true count. And this random walk part is exactly the error. And with a very standard concentration bound, we can prove that um, it is square root n, roughly. How to make the previous scheme private? It is also not that difficult. Now we are not directly uh, include the hash value in, um, in the encoding, but now we are flipping that bit with some small probability. And this technique is called the randomized response. Uh, it says, if we flip that bit with probability one over e to the epsilon plus one, then the whole scheme satisfy epsilon zero LDP. And actually in the one sparse case, event level or user level is equivalent. So now um, we can construct a very natural Stroman scheme from the previous one sparse scheme. So now we are given a k sparse vector so we can just think about it as um, k virtual clients and that all virtual clients will hold a single sparse vector. We simply use the previous one sparse private encoding to encode all those vectors and then send all the encodings to the server. This scheme actually satisfies event level uh, LDP. The server simply computes the sum vectors of all those KN virtual clients and the error will be roughly square root K times N. But this is actually not optimal uh, and we can actually get rid of that squared k factor here. And here's how we do that. It is our starting point of our algorithm design. So in the event level private scheme, uh, our encoder is given a k sparse vector. 
And we, again, use the binary hash S to hash all those non-zero coordinates into a random bit. And then we're using another hash called a bucket hash to hash them into the bucket. And if multiple values are mapped into the same bucket, then we simply add them up. Then we add some lock and noise to protect the privacy. And then our encoding will include the noisy version of the buckets and the description about the binary hash and also the bucket hash. The decoder would simply take this encoding. It would simply first use the bucket hash to reverse the value from um, the buckets to the vector, and then it multiply it to um, the hash vector again. Then we call this our output um, vector. And the server aggregation is the same. That it simply sums up all the decoded vectors. And with a very similar error analysis, uh, we can actually show that um, the error will be roughly a plus one or negative one random walk with a number of hash collision. And because now we're using enough buckets so we can avoid many of the hash collisions and the error would be roughly um, squared n. And here we just improve the previous scheme by squared k factor. Well, the most trickier part is that how we extend the previous scheme to LLDP. It turns out that if we use the naive composition theorem or advanced composition theorem, uh, it could lead to suboptimal parameters. And here, we realized that we can actually tune how many buckets we're gonna use and what's the Laplace and noise we're going to add here. So here's the key observation. Let's say two vectors, and let's say originally their L1 distance is like here, it's three, and boom. We have our um, hashing process, and magically, in the final two buckets, we see the L1 distance is actually much smaller. So what really happens here? It turns out that the hash collision make the L1 distance smaller, because if multiple coordinates are mapped into the same bucket, and originally there could be some difference in those coordinates, and now they're all mapped in the same bucket, they could be positive or negative, and now they're mixed up together, so they could cancel each other out. So this makes the L1 distance smaller. This is, for those who are familiar with DP, this is something like we are compressing um, the sensitivity. And if the L1 distance is compressed, we can actually add smaller noise to the final uh, bucket, and smaller noise just means smaller error. With this idea in mind, uh, we deri derive some parameters, and we derive it for low privacy regime and high privacy regime. Uh, this part is more technical, so I'm gonna skip this. And here's our final theoretical result. For n clients, d-dimensional k-sparse vector aggregation, and we assume the epsilon is a constant, that in both the event level case and the user level case, our scheme will have roughly the same communication cost as the previous uh, result, and our scheme will have squared k times error, uh, smaller error compared to previous result. And our scheme actually have the optimal um, error. Um, here are two lower bounds. The lower bound for event level LDP is an old result, and the user level LDP part is a new result in our paper. So this, uh, the proof for the lower bound is more technical, so I'm gonna skip here. For those who are interested, please take a look. Here are some experimental results uh, for this synthetic data set. We have 10 to the five client for 1,096 dimensional vector. We're actually changing the sparsity K from very sparse to very dense. We're plotting the L infinity error here, and um, our scheme is the lowest line here. So you can see our scheme actually outperform other schemes. And in a typical setting where it is 64 sparse, so it's a pretty sparse vector, and given the event level privacy constraint, our scheme shows seven times reduction in the L infinity error, and the communication cost per client is only 68 bytes, so it's pretty efficient. And for a movie data set, um, we have a pretty big data set, and our scheme shows four times to eight times reduction in the L infinity error, and our scheme has the, low, uh, the smallest communication cost. So yeah, that's it. Um, here are some fi final take home notes. Sparse vector aggregation is a very general and powerful primitive, and our algorithm has efficient communication and nearly optimal error. So for the future work, we would like to do sparse vector aggregation under different privacy models, and we would like to apply our technique to machine learning models. So yeah, thank you, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thanks for the very nice talk. So are there any questions in the room? Please uh, go up to the podium.
algorithm. So I guess, ah, go for it. Yeah, I'll ask a question. Um, I'm curious about whether you have to make any assumptions about the hash function when you reason about the reduction in the L1 sensitivity. Um, yeah, so in, actually in our paper, we generally assume um, random oracle, but uh, we actually have, so you can actually use pseudo-random function, so this is what technically uh, was done. And um, we need to assume the pseudo-random function has some, um, we actually have some more theoretical result in our paper that um, we can actually use something like um, smaller independency. So um, we know that PRF or something like that will have like some um, K independency or something like that. So um, actually there's some previous papers show that if you only need uh, low balancing, you don't need full independency, you can actually need uh, something like log rhythmic independency and it, it is enough. I so, uh, but this part is more technical, so. Yeah, very cool, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great, are there additional questions? So I have one. So uh, can you take, say a little bit about if you wanted to extend your work into computing statistical measures on sparse vectors? Uh, do your techniques generalize or what uh, would be needed to support more expressive queries and just aggregation? Um, do you mean we can do some statistical analysis? Right, so suppose you want to do more co ex compute more complex uh, functions on sparse vectors. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, maybe when it's different uh, results, but the encoding scheme itself is, um, is there, so you can actually use that scheme to encode the vectors and still send it to the server. But because now we're doing a very simple aggregation task such that it can simply be um, add up together and some, the error will be cancel out each other. But if you're doing more complicated uh, tasks, we need to analyze what kinds of tasks we're doing and we need to analyze what kinds of error we're coming from um, the encoding. So, so the encoding, uh, so here we are doing a very simple summation so the analysis um, will be much similar, uh, much simpler than maybe more complicated task. So. Cool. Are there any other questions? Right, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.